So this weekend, we were in Romans 15. A lot going on in this chapter. A few things I want to touch on again from Sunday and then some stuff that we didn't get to on Sunday that I want to make sure we talk about before next Sunday, which is Romans 16, which will be the end of this letter. We talked about verses 1 through to about 21 on Sunday. I'll post a link below if you want to check out the sermon and conversation there. But one of the things that was really interesting to me about chapter 15 is this idea that we are to accept one another then. And then Paul adds that we need endurance and encouragement from God to do that. Uh, This week, Eaton wanted to play in his bedroom and he has these magnetic blocks that we use to build all kinds of stuff. They're actually a lot of fun. So we started to build some things and he was not impressed with what I was building. And so at one point, I think trying to be diplomatic, he suggested that maybe he should do the building and my job could be to sit on the bed and give ideas. And by the way, the stuff that I was building was awesome. It was just, he's a little too young to understand the scope and the vision that I had that day. But gathering up our lessons from last week, I deferred to him, I took up my place on the bed and I suggested maybe you could build a sweet ramp for your cars. And he said, and I quote, bro, I've been building ramps since before you got here. (laughs) Now, a little endurance, a little encouragement. I love this idea because endurance and encouragement just feels a lot like parenting to me, but it also does feel a lot like how any relationship comes alive in our lives. Sometimes we have to know when to endure each other. That's a part of loving someone well. That's a part of being in relationship with them. But so is encouragement. So is helping someone find the courage to grow into themselves. Now, sometimes that means you tell someone not to quit when they need to keep going. But sometimes it also means that you help to remind them it's okay to quit when they are banging themselves against a wall. All of that is this wisdom that Paul is talking about when he uses this word paraklesis, which comes from the paraclete or the Holy Spirit in the ways that we interact with each other. So endure and encourage. What does that mean for you this week in some of your relationships? But that was the first half of chapter 15. In the second half, Paul talks about some really interesting things here that we didn't get to. He says that he wants to come and spend time with the church in Rome. But before that, he needs to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You see, what he's done is he has moved through the area collecting an offering, collecting money from some of these Gentile, non-Jewish churches that he's planted. And he's going to take that to Jerusalem to help the believers, the church there. The economy in Jerusalem is depressed. People are struggling and he wants to make sure they're doing okay. But this is really interesting because all through the letter to Romans, one of the themes in the background for Paul is the ways in which Gentile, non-Jewish, and Jewish believers in the story of Jesus have to come together. How in our diversity, we come to know ourselves more truthfully, and certainly we come to understand God with a more robust imagination. We need each other. We need the people around us. Well, now Paul says that actually accepting one another is not just thinking nice thoughts about each other. It's not just celebrating our diversity. It's actually putting our money where our mouth is. That for the Gentile believers to accept their Jewish siblings, they're going to actually need to take on their Jewish suffering, the depression of the economy. They're going to need to put their resources and their money behind this acceptance. And that becomes really important for me when I think about how do I accept my neighbors? How do I live in community in ways that actually first goes out and understands what people are struggling with, but then uses my resource, uses my skills, uses my money to help alleviate all of that? Do I vote in ways that are good for my neighbors, not just for me? Do I use my money in ways to bless, to care for the people around me who are struggling? All of this is what Paul talks about when he tells us to accept one another then. But there's another piece to this as well, because Paul says that after he's gone to Jerusalem, he would like to get back to Rome. He'd like to spend time with this community here. This is one of the few churches in the early church that Paul didn't plant himself. He's never met these people. He's never spent time with them personally, and he wants to get to do that. Then he wants to go on to Spain to share the gospel there. And he actually invites the Roman church to pray for him, to pray that this would come to pass. But the interesting thing is that it doesn't. 
So Paul does make it back to Rome, but it's in Roman chains. He's arrested and he is brought back to Rome. He writes about this in Philippians and tradition tells us he, he was actually executed here in Rome before he ever got time to spend with this Roman community, this Roman believers here. And this is really interesting to me because it would have been very easy in the early church those first few hundred years to just excise this part of the letter. This part where Paul prays and asks the community to pray that he would get back there and spend time with them. See, they were yearning for that. They were praying for that, but it didn't happen. Why not just cut that out? I mean, why keep a prayer in the Bible that is not answered? And I think this is a real tendency in a lot of our lives. That we have moments where we thought things were going to go a certain way where we put our heart and soul into praying for something and it did not turn out the way that we expected. And oftentimes, maybe because of some toxic theology that we have picked up, maybe because of some shame, we just don't tell that story. We've actually begun to believe that if we had had more faith, if we had prayed the right way, then things would work out differently for us. And so we just forget it. We ignore it. We pretend it's not part of our story. And it would have been really easy for the early church to do exactly the same thing, but they don't. They leave this here. They leave this prayer. They leave this unfulfilled longing as part of Paul's story. And I think that's really instructive for us. First, to understand that when things don't work out well for you, when things don't go the way that you expect, it is not because you did not have enough faith. It's not because you did not pray properly. It's not because there wasn't a community that was behind you supporting you. It's simply the fact that we live in a world where people make choices and those choices impinge upon us. Sometimes things do not work out well. And the Bible retains all of that sadness, all of that lament, and it honors the points in your story where the same thing has happened to you. Now, there's something else about this as well. Because Paul does make it back to Rome. He is in Romans chains. He writes about this in Philippians. And even there, he's able to praise God. The fact that the divine is with him in those moments, even though it did not turn out the way that he had hoped. And I think there's important things here about the way that we can re-narrate our past. I'm not talking about pretending it didn't happen. I'm not talking about rewriting the past and pretending that things were different than they really were. But there are still ways that we can look back on our history. And maybe in those moments where we believed we truly were forgotten and abandoned by God. And when we look back with the benefit of hindsight, we can actually begin to see the ways that God was near us, the divine was present to us, even when we didn't notice it in the moment. So we don't rewrite the past, we don't pretend the past didn't happen, but we re-narrate the past and we notice all of the ways that God was building us, God was near us, God was with us, even in the moments when we suffered. And I think the Bible does a really profound job of inviting us to see all of these stories, the times when we thought we were going to go from here to there and it would be one straight line with God on our side, and in reality, it was very different. It was a lot of zigs and zags and detours and dead ends, and yet, when we look back, we see the presence of the divine spirit near us, with us, encouraging us, enduring with us, reminding us to keep going, that even when we change course, there is a God who is with us in the midst of it. And your Bible is far more in tune with all of the complexities of life than sometimes we imagine. And over the years, we may have picked up bad theology that tells us that if anything goes wrong, it's our fault. And the Bible stands in stark contrast to that, telling us that sometimes life takes all kinds of roads we do not expect. And a good faith is not one that makes everything work out for us as if God was our servant doing what we ask for when we ask the right way, as if our prayers could control God. No, God is the one who walks with us through our joy and through our pain, who endures with us through seasons of success and walks through with us through seasons of lament and suffering. May you recognize God in all of those moments. May you never feel shame for the moments when things haven't worked out the way that you expected. But may you look back 
recognize all those moments where God was with you, God was caring for you, God was bringing people into your life to speak goodness and peace to you in those moments. And may you then get to play that role for someone else who is struggling in this moment. May your acceptance of them look like those Gentile churches who took up the sufferings of their Jewish siblings and accepted them in the ways that their stories intersected. May you actually become the presence of the divine for them in their moment this week.